Welcome everyone. We are here today for our Margins Community Program. Um, this is our second installation, um, or third installation actually. And we're here to talk about um, a book that came out this year. And um, we get to actually do that, even though a lot of books aren't getting to do that. So I'm excited about that. So just to give everyone here a little bit of framework about what we're doing here today. So um, about a year ago, uh, myself and the um, incomparable Susie Q. Smith started putting together a conference for writers from the margins. And we were looking forward to a big party in August here in Denver. Obviously, that is looking a little bit different now. Um, we're already switching that into a virtual affair, which we're really excited about. And one of the cool things that we get to do with that virtual switch is that we don't actually have to just stick with one weekend anymore. And I know that we all are aware that writers whose books have come out this year um, have lost a lot of opportunities to, to share those books with readers and to, to get that connection that we usually get to get. So we're excited that we get to put a few opportunities back into the world with this community programming that we're doing. So let's get into the main event here. Um, we are here to hear from Bobby Lefebvre and Cesar. And so let me just give you a little bit of background about the two folks that we're hearing from today. Bobby Lefebvre is a poet, performer, and cultural worker. He's the current poet laureate for the state of Colorado. In fact, he's the youngest and first poet laureate of color. You may also know him as the writer of the acclaimed play Northside about gentrification in Denver, which Bobby has described as an unapologetic celebration of cultural preservation and permanence and a eulogy to things lost. Something you may not have already known about Bobby is that he is also the manager of our local unaccompanied refugee minor program, which makes him the perfect person to be in conversation today with Cesar Quatomic. I'm sorry about that, Cesar. Let me try again. Cesar Quatomic Garcia Hernandez who is a writer and law professor at the University of Denver who focuses on migration policy. Um, policing, excuse me. He has been a Fulbright Scholar and received the 2014 Derek A. Bell Jr. Award, which is awarded to a law professor who has made an extraordinary contribution to legal education, the legal system, or social justice. He speaks and writes about the convergence of criminal and immigration law, including the book that we're here to learn about today, Migrating to Prison, America's Obsession with Locking Up Immigrants. I can't wait to hear more. So take us away, Bobby. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Vinyanka. Um, I would encourage everyone out there who isn't familiar with margins to get familiar with that. Um, I'm also involved in that project and looking forward to uh, all of the things we have planned. Um, but I'm really excited to be here in conversation today with uh, Cesar. Cesar, thank you so much for your work. Um, you know, your work is so complicated at the intersections of academia and, and social justice. At least this is the way I, I, I look at your work. And um, so we're going to get into conversation. I have some questions for you. I know we're going to hear from you. You're going to do a reading of the book. Um, but as a writer, as a poet, I'm always curious um, about what your process was like, your process for, for writing the book. Uh, as a creative person um, who, you know, spends time and, and attention to the writing process, I'm curious as, as an academic, um, what that was like for you. Do you consider your work artistic work? Do you consider your approach uh, to be creative? Yeah, thanks, Bobby, uh, for for that question, and thanks so much to to you for joining me here um, this afternoon, and to Vinyanka for for making this opportunity available to to me. Um, you know, the, that's that's a, it's th this question of, of artistry and um, scholarship, uh, academic focused scholarship, is. Um, one that I've struggled with immensely, um, and 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 always going back decades, I've had this this um, line in mind um, that sort of has 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 driven my career trajectory and my work, and that's this 
a, a, a description that, that Julian Mayfield, who is a, a journalist, um, wrote of, um, a, a, a James Baldwin in a piece about James Baldwin. And he said, said something along the lines of, and I'm going I'm to paraphrase here now because I don't have it in front of me. But he says something like, would that the artist could be uh, a scholar and vice versa. Um, and I've always thought like that the, there is um, there is something in, incredibly valuable about the the life of the mind that is the the, the work of intellectuals people who get to to uh, devote an enormous amount or who 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 devote an enormous amount of time to to unpacking the phenomenon that 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 um, we all um, are are dealing with on a daily basis, especially communities of color, especially poor people. Um, and I have the enormous privilege of actually getting paid to do that. Right, that's my day job, um, and it sort of affords me access to an enormous amount of resources that in in communities of color. Um, uh, are are few and far between, right? There are not enough, nearly enough people like me who get access to those. And so I've taken very seriously, not only the the obligation to engage and the privilege of engaging in that deep, think, deep scholarly thinking, but also to try to convey it in a way that resonates with people. Um, my father, who passed away many years ago, but he used to he he used to uh, read some of my early uh, early writings, and he would say, "Look, I don't understand what you're saying here." Right, and that was that was always like the hardest thing, right? And my father was a reader. That's why I'm a reader. But my father finished high school, and that was it. Um, and you know, my mom, my mom finished the third grade. Um, and and so conveying ideas that, that may be complicated, that may be historically really embedded um, and needed to be unpacked in a way that resonates with with my parents, like people like my parents, like that's always been really meaningful to me, that drive. And to the extent that I'm able to complete it, I mean, accomplish that, you know, that's a work in progress. And that's obviously ultimately up to the readers to decide whether or not I've gotten anywhere near there, but that's the goal. Yeah, that's an amazing sort of um, uh, approach to the work. I think as a, as a poet, I, I sort of struggle with that myself because I think that there's a lot of people that are turned off by the idea of poetry because it's it's often presented as this sort of esoteric thing that um, is inaccessible. But I think that the the goal of, of good poetry, the goal of good writing, whether that's what you're doing or what I'm doing, is communication. And if we're not communicating, if we're not able to have that dialogue, um, we're we're losing folks. And I think that that's that's not um, that's not something we should aim for. Uh, I was able to to read your book. I picked it up and and I finished it. Really, I, I got through it. I, I picked it up and I really liked the way that it it flowed. Uh, I, I I heard your voice in it. Um, so I think if if you don't mind, why don't we begin the conversation with you, um, sort of reading from your book, so that folks can get a, an idea of what it sounds like and and what some of the the content of that is. Yeah, I'd love to to, to take that opportunity. Um, and and before before I do, let me just give you a little bit of context to, to what I'll be, um, the, the passage that I'll be reading from. So I, I, I was born and raised in South Texas in, in McAllen, um, which is about uh, seven miles north of the Rio Grande River. So a, very much a border town. And I left um, McAllen as a teenager after high school to, to head, head off to New England to go to, um, uh, study, to go to college. And then I spent some time working and went to uh, uh, and, and, and went back to South Texas only only as, um, after I was a, a lawyer. Um, so I was a very, very newly minted lawyer in 2008 um, when I returned to, to McAllen. And I immediately started practicing law um, by representing uh, folks who were facing the possibility of deportation while they were locked up. And they were locked up in these large facilities that, um, that, that are in, in South Texas and that I never knew existed. Um, despite having having been there, um, the bulk of my life and my family having been there. And I remember very vividly the first time I drove to one of these facilities. It's, it's called the Port Isabel Detention Center. Um, and it's about, it's about 1,500 beds, so fairly large. Um, and it's been around since the mid 80s. So not at all new by the time that I was making my way there. And I remember thinking as I was going that I'd never been to this part of our, my, of my community. It was it was gorgeous. It was this really pretty, um, well preserved. Um, what was actually it's actually a wildlife refuge. Um, so it's it, it's it got these gorgeous um, uh, uh, white egrets that that nest there and like native bamboo and such. 
And I was thinking, wow, I, I, this is this this place is amazing. And all of a sudden, I run into the the perimeter fencing of this facility and the and the guardhouse right right at the entrance. And it was jarring that the that that um, that dissonance between the the natural beauty um, that I was just admiring, and all of a sudden, there's this perimeter fencing, and in the distance, you see the the exterior concrete walls of the facility and you go through this first security checkpoint just to get into the parking lot and then you, know, you get out of your car and you go into the facility and go through another layer of security checkpoints just to, to just and then you're escorted just to be able to meet with your client which is what, what i was there to do and so these places are um, um are, are spread in communities like south texas but they're also in places much nearer to the place that i now call home denver um, there's one in Aurora, Colorado, um, a suburb of Denver, which is not very far from where I'm sitting right now. Um, and also, uh, uh, one of the older facilities it has been around since, since the eighties as well. I um, mean, that facility, um, like in the, the ones in, 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 in South Texas, you know, life in these places is, 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 is very difficult. And, and in fact, I think, I think one of the themes of the book and of the passage that I, that I'll read from. Uh, or that I'll read is is the sense that the these these immigration prisons exist specifically to make life harder for migrants to make to to bring the 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 the, the coercive uh, um, arm of the of the federal government on top of on top on onto mig migrants' uh, lives and onto their families um, and in fact sometimes people die in these facilities that's exactly what happened here in Aurora um, with a gentleman named Kamyar Samimi now, he'd been in the U S for about forty years. And one day, um, immigration and customs official, uh, enforcement officials showed up at his door. They arrested him, and they took him down to this ICE facility in in, in Aurora, which is owned uh, an, uh, by a private prison company. And despite having been in the U.S. 40 years, despite having a green card, meaning he had a permission to be in the U.S., to work in the U.S., he died within he died two weeks after being arrested. In, um, in, and taken to the Aurora facility. And when he died, the government issued a press release um, and the press release said like, he died, he died all, of a, all of a sudden. Well, the government's internal investigation report, which was released only um, a, a, about a year later and only after um, a, a lawsuit was filed and also by um, open records requests that were fi was filed by a, a local journalist, um, actually, that, that investigation actually said that the that the medical staff at the facility had not followed the instructions provided by the doctor. Right. So immigration prisons are, are are places where where the government sometimes oversees suffering, but also to the extent that sometimes not it's not just life that's suffering; it's life that's ending in these facilities. And so I wrote migrating to prison to trace how 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 this. Um, uh, uh, immigration prisons became such a common feature of the way that we enforce immigration law these days, but also to point out that for about 25 years in the, in the, in the 20th century, the middle of the 20th century, um, we, we actually didn't really use them, um, and life went down without them. So I want to, I want to read this passage to give you a sense of why it is that this this penal trend um, has become such a, a familiar uh, phenomenon, and that is um, uh, to 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 illustrate the way in which the money is being made from from human bondage in places like this. Um, so let me read for for a couple of minutes, and then and then and then um, uh, get back to our, our conversations. Um, so this comes from from a, 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 a facility um, down in um, in New Mexico, and most days are quiet in Milan, New Mexico. The Wild Diner offers a 1950s throwback experience with red booths lining the U-shaped building. And Kiva Cafe smothers its sopapillas in a red chili that screams New Mexico cuisine. If Milan's 3,000 residents want more options, they can jump on Interstate 40 and head an hour and a half east to Albuquerque, unless they are locked up. Almost 40% of Milan's population lives inside the Cibola County Correctional Center, a monochromatic complex of beige buildings tucked behind the Wild Diner. Owned and run by Core Civic, one of the two largest operators of private prisons in the United States, for many years the Cibola County Correctional Center held people convicted of entering the United States clandestinely, which is a federal crime. As convicted criminals, they were behind bars because they were being punished. Rings of concertina wire stretched across the tops of two layers of fencing leave a clear impression that punishment is the goal. 
In return for running the Milan prison, CoreCivic received a steady revenue stream from the Justice Department's Bureau of Prisons. Milan, meanwhile, came to value the prison's place in the town's slumbering economy. Roughly 300 locals worked there. When the Bureau of Prisons announced in July 2016 that it would not renew its contract with CoreCivic, uh, which at the time was known as the Corrections Corporation of America, a shudder jolted the community. One resident, reflecting on the many prison employees she knew whose livelihoods were suddenly at risk, boiled down her thoughts to this. It just, it sucks. In the summer of 2016, the federal prison agency's decision to cut off the Cibola County facility seemed like its death knell. Who would want to do business with a prison so problematic if the Bureau of Prisons had decided to sever its 15-year relationship? Seeing the imminent hit to employment rise ominously on the economic horizon, local officials and CCA executives sprung into action. The consequences of the Bureau of Prisons' decision were frightening. For some officials, that made the path forward unambiguous. My first option is for it to stay private because of the revenue the prison produces for the city of Milan. The local state senator, a Democrat named Clemente Sanchez said, well, before the month of October was out, Sanchez could breathe a sigh of relief and CCA officials could celebrate success. Another contract was in place, this time with the Department of Homeland Security. As the federal government's principal immigration law enforcement arm, ICE is tasked with detaining people facing the possibility of forcible removal through the nation's immigration court system. Except for when ICE officers mistakenly pick up a US citizen, everyone locked up on behalf of ICE is either a migrant waiting to learn whether she will be allowed to remain in the United States or a migrant already ordered removed awaiting the next available one-way spot on an airplane or a bus. But unlike the Bureau of Prisons, ICE doesn't punish, doesn't imprison to punish. It imprisons to give the federal government time to decide who gets to be in the United States and who doesn't. This isn't punishment, courts tell us. It's just deciding where on the map people should stand. So as a result of those processes of, of, of profiting off of, of locking up uh, people, we see every year four or 500,000 migrants who are held behind bars or behind barbed wire at one point in the year, um, stretching back to the days of the Obama administration and certainly continuing to today. Um, so, so that's um, sort of the gist of, of, of the book, um, except for you know, this, this, this hope that I articulate at the end, which is that um, you know, the, it, the, 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 the way we do things now doesn't necessarily need to dictate the way we do things in the future. And in fact, it hasn't um, always been this way. So I write about how in the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration in the midst of the Cold War actually shut down facilities on the uh, detention facilities on the East Coast and on the West Coast. Most importantly, um, the, uh, a detention facility that existed on Ellis Island, the very same Ellis Island that we uh, mythologize as this place that welcomed generations of newcomers to the U.S. And it certainly did do that. But it was also an immigration prison, one that I like to think of as having a particularly ironic view of the Statue of Liberty. Um, and so if we could do things differently in our past, I think we can do things differently in our future. And we just have to muster the, 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 the intellectual courage to envision that future and then the political courage to make that future reality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, wanted I wanted to, to uh, let all of our, our viewers know that you can ask any question that you would like in the chat function. Uh, we want this to be interactive. So if there's something that you have to, to ask in addition to uh, our conversation, we'd like to include you in that. So please throw any questions that you might have for us in the uh, chat function. Uh, I kind of want to start, you made a, a really interesting point at the at the top of your, your, your when you're giving context about the book, uh, you know, you were raised um, in South Texas by by na bi-national, bicultural, bilingual, but you didn't know that these facilities existed until you came back as a lawyer. Um, what was that like first reaction? Did you have a visceral reaction to the one understanding now that these do exist? And how did that maybe initial reaction really contribute to um, kind of sowing the seed of passion for you to, to create this project? 
Yeah, well, what the first the first um, emotion uh, was this this um, sense of disconnection that um, in while I was simultaneously admiring the stunning beauty of the the wildlife refuge and these gorgeous birds that I'd never even seen existed, I now know a lot more about them um, <laughs> than, than I did at the time. Um, but uh, and and then that was being contrasted with the stark the stark uh, uh, image of the prison in the distance. Um, that initial that initial reaction also I think planted this this sense in me that that became migrating in prison because I realized then that if I didn't know that these facilities existed, um, then the likelihood that other people knew was also limited, right? Was also also low. Um, I I have always been um, uh, an, a, 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 an intense reader. Um, I I love learning about and have always loved really enjoyed learning about the history of of this region, um, the the politics of this region. Um, it's a very it's a heavily Mexican uh, community. It's a very poor community. Um, it's one that I, I continue to have very strong ties to. I have family there. I'm, I'm still um, part of a, a law firm that is based there. Um, it's my family's my my two brothers um, who who um, who are the principal uh, lawyers in that in that law firm. Um, and 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 yet I in all of my um, understanding as well, as well as I thought I understood this region, I didn't know that this had that these places existed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and certainly had no idea what was inside i mean the, the conditions in which people who were forced to be in those places were were, were living in um and so i think i think the sense that this book this book really did does um begin in that in that initial moment where i start to see that this is such an important feature not only of this community but of the story of the development of immigration law um, across the entire united states and the story of of race and how race how race and 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 um, economics and and capitalist markets um, really um, um, meld together very neatly um, in the commodification of these human beings who are mm -hmm. being ship who are being brought into encouraged to come into the U.S. Um, locked up. And in many ways, then um, uh, 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 profited from um, not only while they're out working in our communities, but when they're also being held inside these facilities. Yeah. So the, I guess one thing is to you know find out that they exist, and then you know have that initial sort of reaction. And another thing is to actually then go inside as someone who is working with the folks that are contained there. And, and last week, you know, I think everything has has context and it, and it kind of changes and evolves. But last week, um, Carlos Ernesto Escobar Mejia was the first person to to die in immigration detention of, of coronavirus. And um, I believe he was in the Ote Mesa Detention Center in, in San Diego, um, which I think is the most infected immigration detention facility in the country. So talk to us about the environments inside some of those facilities and how will and does this virus exacerbate already problematic conditions yeah ote mesa is a particularly interesting place um uh, I've, I've i've been there and um it's it's it, it's fascinating because it, you know people often describe it as, as being yeah, near san diego i mean it's really like it, it is sort of geographically near San Diego, but it is a whole different world from, you know, the image of San Diego that, that most people have of the beaches and the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the tan bodies, right? Um, it's out in the desert. Um, and you can actually see Mexico from, from you can see the border um, from, the, from the parking lot um, at Ote Mesa. Um, it's a facility that in every way, um, in every way is a prison. Um, it's got multiple layers of, of concertina barbed wire that stretches along the tops of um, perimeter chain link fencing. Um, to when you arrive, you 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 park and then you walk to a, a, a gate that's chain link fencing, and there's a camera there. There's a, a buzzer there that you, know, you have to speak into just to get permission to get into the perimeter. Um, not into the facility, but into the perimeter, and then you get into the f f facility, and you're going through multiple other layers of of, of security. Um, and interestingly enough, um, at the very same time that um, the the um, uh, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency holds its 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 inmates in that facility, um, in other wings of the facility, 
um, uh, there are people who are being prosecuted for federal crimes of uh, illegal entry and illegal reentry, which is which are two federal immigration crimes. So, um, they're basically coming to the United States without the government's permission. Um, and so there be people being prosecuted for crimes there, be people being prosecuted through the immigration court system there, um, different government agencies, but they're all federal agencies that are paying this private prison corporation to to detain um, these these folks in what to anyone who's um, watched any movie about a prison just looks like a prison I and mean, it's it, it, these are dormitory style uh, facilities where they're individual uh, there's common rooms and then individual cells uh, or uh, small cells with with bunk beds in them um, where you can have you know two to four people um, who are who are housed in, in each of those cells and then um, you know all of the movements are strictly controlled everything's watched um, um, and so it's not at all a, a surprise that you would have a contagious disease especially something um, so so new, so unknown as COVID-19 spread really quickly through these facilities. And you mentioned, you know, Ote Mesa has a really a high rate of, of, of infection. Um, you know, one of the things that is, that is characterizing ICE's response to COVID-19 is, is, is a lack of response. Um, they, they hold um, about these days since COVID-19 hit, um, they're holding about 37,000 people in a given day. They've tested uh, something like 1,500, 1,600 total people um, in in that time, uh, and and about a third of those have uh, tests have come out come back positive. Um, so I think you know the reality is at this point we do, we have very little information about the true extent of this, and that's not at all surprising. ICE is very, very uh, um, uh, um, notorious for having um, poor medical care and even um, even worse um, interest in communicating what's happening inside to folks who, who are not on the inside, as, as illustrated by what happened to Kamyar Samimi. Um, you know, it took over a year before we found out what was actually going on and what was happening was that the guy was actually getting worse and worse and worse, not by the day, but by the hour. And that was in the government's own records. Um, but we didn't learn about that um, through the press release. We didn't learn about that in response to, to um, uh, inquiries by then Congressman um, Jared Polis. Um, we we learned about it only because a reporter was tenacious enough to force the government to, uh, and local attorneys were tenacious enough to force the government to release its internal investigation report. And that's not the way you ought to be running um, these facilities where people's lives are literally in the government's hands and where sometimes things go really, 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 really badly. Yeah, you know, I think that one thing that I, I really gathered from reading your book, if I had to summarize it in in one sentence, is the 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 idea of of profit in politics um, being the you know the the thing that is keeping these things moving and. We always have to have, it seems like we always have a scapegoat, right? This country always has a scapegoat. And, and right now, um, it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, our, our migrant you know, family are, are being scapegoated. And at, at the same time, president-controlled narratives of, you know, to some degree, I guess, inform social perception. And, and I, as I was reading parts of your book, um, I believe it was in chapter three, uh, I kind of came to the conclusion that, like, Nixon was to the Black community what Trump is to migrants today. And you mentioned that, you know, crime really took racist position as the, the recognized and socially acceptable marker of dangerousness and concern. And this fear that was created um, uh, became the public face of racism. So how does this rhetoric that we're hearing lead to real life consequences for our migrant family? Yeah, I think it leads to real life consequences um, in, in the form of of, of, of rhetoric turning into policies, um, which then turn into on the ground law enforcement practices. Mm. Um, so that when you have um, an, an administration like, like we have right now that talks about uh, migrants as, as rapists, right? Where the president launches his, his campaign, his successful campaign, um, using that language specifically, where, um, where the president's first attorney general, Jeff Sessions, a former senator from, from, um, 
Alabama, uh, Alabama, yes, uh, um, talks about um, uh, migrants as uh, um, trying to destroy uh, American democracy. Um, then, then it only makes sense that the, the, the government ought to throw everything it has at this enormous danger, right? At people who are going to behead us and rape us and, 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 and subvert this, this centuries old experiment in democracy. Well, of course they, they should throw everything at us, but of course that reality, the rea reality parts weighs enormously from that, from, from that rhetoric. Um, and I wish I could say that this is a, this is a, a, a very Trumpian um, uh, phenomenon. Um, but as one of the things that I try to, to point out in the book is that we have a, a decades long tradition, a bipartisan tradition of using similar language. And Trump is the most extreme form of that. He's the most abrasive, he's the most explicitly racist, misogynist version of that. But he's the extension of a earlier trend. You know, President Obama in, in November 2014, did a, a a speech from the White House where he where he um, uh, said his administration's uh, uh, priorities, immigration enforcement priorities, would be target felons, not families. But the the problem is that those categories fall apart the moment that we start to try to map them onto real human beings. Because of course, felons have families. Families include felons. Um, in communities of color, that is not at all an unusual phenomenon. We are very well aware of, aware of that. And we also know that simply because somebody gets a criminal record, doesn't mean that they're thrown out of their families, right? The love that a, that, that a parent has for a child, the love that a spouse has for, for a partner, the love that a child has for for a parent doesn't dissipate. I write about a, a, a number of these individuals in the book. Um, uh, Cecilia Cajua, whose father um, was 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 convicted of of um, uh, after getting busted for for uh, um, having a meth lab in in his family's garage, and she says, "Look, he was a great father to me." He did what he did, but he was a great father to me. And the moment that he got deported, um, it was like it, it was like I was being punished. And I went to go see him once, and I just I could not go back because because when he was when he was locked up in a facility in Arizona, and she says I couldn't I couldn't go back to see him because I felt like I was imprisoned alongside him. Mm -hmm. I, I write about Jerry um, Armijo, who was uh, uh, raised in South Texas, not far from me, but he was born in Mexico, so he wasn't a U.S. citizen. He was a, he had a green card, and with that green card, he joined the army. And he's all in Iraq, fight, going around in tanks for the U.S. Army. And he goes over an IED, and it gives him, it traumatizes him, gets him PTSD. So he gets back sent to South, South Texas again, doesn't get the care that he needs, and he ends up, you know, self-medicating in the way that lots of people do with drugs. Eventually, the police catch up with him, and 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 lo and behold, before you know it, ICE does too. And while while he's trying to get re he's trying to get his uh, back on his feet. Um, uh, and, and, and is actually going through a, a court-ordered rehabilitation program, um, ICE just arrests him and takes him down to his immigration prison and they're trying, trying to deport the guy, right? Um, without any sense that um, uh, uh, his, his, his criminal history um, is only one part of who he is, just like for all of us. Our worst, we all make mistakes and those things, those mistakes don't, um, those don't, don't mark us as different. They mark us as human, mm -hmm. right? But for most, for those of us who are U.S. citizens, our mistakes are quite often, we're fortunate enough, in, fortunate enough that those mistakes don't then dictate the course that our life takes from there on in. And for, for, for people who aren't citizens, that's often not true. Yeah, you know, one thing that I, I, I really appreciated and kind of took away from um, what I read in your book was your idea about, um, I don't know exactly what you're saying, so I'm paraphrasing, but you, you talk about like uh, celebrating the ordinary, right? That we're, these folks um, have ordinary lives just like us, but we expect them to live these extraordinary lives that are free of all of the things that we engage in all the time, um, imperfections, uh, maybe sometimes we we commit crimes. Maybe sometimes we're not perfect, and and that human that humanity is often lost in these conversations. And and I think the symbolism of of confinement. You know, you were talking about, um, you know, especially as it applies to the way that they're treated. You know, the way that our our family is being treated there. They're they're shackled and and chained and held in 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 cages in places that in some you know cases hold 
stock, you know, animals. And so what is this? Is this a, a deliberate psychological attack on the on the psyche and humanity of these folks to, to make examples of people? Is, is, is that, pro, you know, prog process a, a logistical necessity? And, and, you know, talk to us a little bit about, about the, the, the psychological implications of those things. And what have you seen, you know, talking with these folks when they're in there about how that that breaks them down or not? Yeah, well, I think I think certainly it's hard on the individual people who are going through that process, right? No, no, no doubt uh, uh, about that. And we often see that. To, to your last question, we often see that um, uh, a really concrete consequence in the fact that many people who who um, have legitimate legal claims to make ways of fighting off deportation, ways of avoiding it, will give it up, and they say this place is so damn bad that I just want out. And the fastest way out, as guards will remind people day in and day out, is sign this piece of paper, agree to your deportation, and you'll be on the next airplane. If you're Mexican and along the border, you'll be on the next bus, right? So in a matter of, of hours or days, you're gonna you're gonna get your freedom, right? A really perverse form of freedom, and particularly particularly so when you have a legitimate legal claim. But that's the reality for those folks. For the for for other people, though, I think the symbolic uh, aspect of immigration prisons is enormously powerful. It's the sense of what could happen if you dare raise your voice, right? What could happen if you dare step beyond the boundaries of what you are expected to of how you are expected to be a member of these of of, of the this, of this uh, of this community that we call the United States, because let's be clear, you know, folks who are in, are not U.S. citizens, whether they're green card holders or whether they have absolutely no 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 formal permission to be in the United States, they are members of our communities, they are members of our families, and they are in, they are fully participating in many many ways, economically, socially, culturally, religiously, civically, right, um, educationally. Go on, you can go on forever on um, listing the ways that folks are are are, are involved. And, and making our communities richer, more vibrant. Um, but but those those boundaries are 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 are, are set as as a as a, uh, as a uh, with the, with the prison as as the reminder of the horror that can come to folks who 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 make them their presence known in a way that is impermissible. And so it's a way of marginalizing people, right? They say, look, if you want to avoid that fate. The fate of others who you know that are, that are, have suffered um, a very real fate, not a not a fictional fate, not a mythical fate, but a very real fate. Then you need to do everything within your power to case to stay within these boundaries of permissible behavior, right? And what does that mean? That means um, uh, um, abiding by um, by by uh, uh, economic relations and, and 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 social relations that allow for easy easy ex uh, much more e much easier exploitability and the antidote of course is 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 collective um, uh, organizing that allows folks to to be able to to defend themselves and members of their communities. Yeah, and that that marginalization that you talk about, um, you know, that othering, that exploitation. Uh, kind of begets exploitation, right? You mentioned that um, the Bracero program, for example, my, my great grandfather on my mother's side was, uh, was a Bracero. Um, how does this country though, with its you know, thirst for, for rabid capitalism and its fetish for cheap labor, how do we, or they negotiate that, that push-pull paradox? You know, you, you included a, a quote in, in the book from, from Truman about the Braceros that basically said, and I think this is still re very relevant in the way that we look at labor, um, especially, you know, uh, ex exploitation of workers. Uh, he said something to the effect of like, Braceros should be ready to go to work when, when we need them and be gone when we don't. Right. Um, so what is, talk to us a little bit about, about that push-pull paradox. How does that get negotiated or do we not even care because profit is the end goal? Yeah, well, I think I think it's important to keep in mind that that while folks are being locked up, while there's we're 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 um, maintaining this enormous immigrant uh, ICE ICE uh, personnel network of twenty thousand or so officers spread throughout the interior U.S. and alongside that a border patrol network of of, of basically the, the the same the same number about nineteen thousand um, border patrol agents spread across the United States. 
um, mostly along the southwest border. You know, there's a, there 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 is profitability, um, and so we we have to uh, keep in mind that these are these are not um, revenue neutral policies. These are, on the contrary, these are profit maximizing policies, um, and it's a question of whose 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 profit um, is 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 is, uh, is 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 being had and at whose as whose expense. Um, and so I think I think the negotiation um, that's happening is is a very real negotiation that's happening every single day in which people. Um, who live in in families, uh, uh, migrant families, or in families um, and in migrant communities, um, uh, have a, a very palpable uh, sense that uh, there is a very real, very very real uh, uh, threat. Um, that there is um, a whole series of, of of laws and of policies backed up with boots on the ground, as they say. Um, uh, that um, is very much in, intended to perpetuate existing racial hierarchies. Um, and, and it happens at the threat of being locked up and potentially, uh, potentially uh, forcibly removed from the United States. That's not just along the Southwest, that's in communities like Denver and um, everywhere else in, in the country. Sure. We got a question from the chat. Um, I want to bring into the space. Um, uh, Benjamin Martinez asks, uh, could you talk about the absurdity of how American policy actually increases the likelihood that immigrants will try to migrate to America? And what are the main reasons people do try to migrate here? Yeah, well, the last part of that question um, is one that changes over time. Um, and uh, we see, you know, for example, you, you, you mentioned your great grandfather coming here as a, as a uh, bracero. My, my, my grandfather, my mom's uh, father, came to the U.S. as, as a bracero. Um, and, and he was the first of his family to start coming to, to the United States, um, but certainly far from the last of his family. Um, his oldest sons uh, followed him as braceros as, as well, my mom's older brothers, my, my uncles. Um, and so um, by the time my, my mother was a little younger, but by the time that she got to be old enough to start working um, uh, to help support the family, um, she did not, uh, she was not a, a bracero, um, but she, the program had actually ended by, by that point. Um, but she went to the Northern Mexican cities that her uh, father and, and older brothers had gone um, uh, as an initial uh, sort of disembarkation point because now they had they had um, they had family there, right? So she went to go live with them. That's a border town, um, Reynosa, which is where my where she met my father. Uh, my father had had been living in McAllen uh, in Texas, right on the other side of the border. They met in Reynosa. They started a family, and you know, as 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 they say, uh, the rest is history. That's how that's how my siblings and I um, came came to be. So my family, very much um, like like many um, Mexican families in particular, but but folks from all over the the the, the world as well, come to the United States in search of of economic opportunity, um, not because they. Th threw a dart on the wall, but because there were very explicit pro uh, formal policies, recruitment policies, mm -hmm. like the Brasero program. These days, we're seeing that, um, like in the 1980s in particular, um, um, we're seeing that lots of folks from Central America are coming here specifically f uh, fleeing for their lives, um, seeking seeking uh, refuge. Um, that is an enormously uh, 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 worrisome. Uh, uh, well, our response has been enormously worrisome, and that's but it's an enormously significant trend, and one that is um, one that is uh, um, uh, 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 can potentially be incorporated into existing asylum laws. But we have, we have to um, keep in mind that you know, the 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 uh, asylum legal system has never pretended to protect people from death. Mm. It protects people from certain deaths for certain reason, from, from persecution for certain reasons. There are five reasons in the law. Um, and if you don't fall into one of those five reasons, then it's not there to protect you. And what we've seen is that the Trump administration has narrowed the definition of those five reasons. Um, and, and, um, uh, and, and that's, that's hugely problematic. Um, but, but asylum law has never been um, able to protect people who are fleeing from their lives 
even in the in the in the terrible moment in um uh that gave rise to to world war ii that from which asylum laws modern asylum laws you know emanate um we have to remember that many 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 people lost their lives to give us the asylum network that uh, asylum legal uh, infrastructure that currently exists sure uh we got uh, another question from the chat um hi what is your idea of american exceptionalism that m immigrants are subjugated to especially considering the lack of exceptionalism in quotes we are seeing in today's time well immigration law formally does uh, uh doesn't doesn't recognize the existence of migrants it recognizes the existence of u.s citizens and aliens mm -hmm. um aliens of course being these 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 people from from some other world um, the kinds of people that, you know, Superman is intended to protect us from. I actually love Superman because, and I use Superman a lot in my classes because Superman is of course the most, the most patriotic of, of, of unauthorized migrants. You know, he just landed one day in Kansas, um, never, never sought permission, um, to, to be in the United States and just started passing, passing himself off as a U.S. citizen. Um, uh, but, um, uh, uh, but, but the sense of exceptionalism is one that is embedded in, in immigration law, right? But very explicitly, very literally by using words like, like alien, which of course is, is as, as a writer, as a poet, you, you, you understand that the, the words matter, right? We use particular words to convey certain meanings, certain substance. Um, and we have a whole, whole, whole range of options for which we could use to describe people who are not U S citizens, but we've chosen. Um, that one, the sense of, 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 of exceptionalism, though, goes beyond that, right? It, it extends to the fact that immigration law allows for people, mandates that people be locked up if they commit any number of, of transgressions that for, 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 for um, uh, in many communities across the United States are commonplace. So for example, uh, here, here, here in Denver, um, when when the mayor was announcing that we were about to go into a shelter in place order, you know, he 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 uh, uh, there was the 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 city um, um, announced that they were, they were going to exempt some uh, marijuana dispensaries, right? Um, meanwhile, possession of marijuana is reason enough to get yourself thrown into an immigration prison. It's reason enough to get get, get yourself deported from 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 uh, the United States, um, and yet we see that. In communities uh, 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 of, of, of color, the kind of policing that we're very familiar with, especially in the drug war context, um, um, has, has enormous implications for immigration law because we rely on the stain of criminality, the conviction process, the criminal conviction process as the way of determining who's desirable and who's not desirable, mm -hmm. right? When Obama says felons, he means people who have been convicted of a particular kind of crime through a criminal justice justice system that is enormously disproportionately affecting communities of color. And yet, you know, I grew up in a, in a poor Mexican community in South Texas. I had never seen as much crime as, as my first weekend on a college campus. Right. <laughs> when I was in an Ivy League campus, I assure you the police weren't smelling their way to crime, um, even though they could have. Yeah, I think that you, you know, you talk about that also and how, you um, you know, this, this whole system is, is sort of attempting to uphold, uh, this notion of public safety and protect people from, from the boogeyman. Right. And, and in this country, we, we do that well with, with people of color and the, and the way that the system uses that good, bad binary when it comes to how we see race, how we see migrants. Um, but what I also found interesting is the ways in which, uh, the black white binary was sort of laid in front of us um, through this process, creating disproportionate detainment of, of black migrants. Um, say something about that, about how those identities intersect and are, you know, create disparity. Yeah, of course. Anytime that we we pile consequences on top of the criminal justice system in the United States, what's gonna that that's gonna translate into is that is that people who are racialized as black are going to be are going to suffer the the, uh, the brunt of the of, of of those consequences. Maybe not numerically, but in terms of, of the disproportionate impact. Um, and when we see that with 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 Haitian migrants, um, we see that with Jamaicans, um, um, and 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 primarily in places along along the the Northeast where they there are large uh, black migrant communities uh, where folks are living in in um, uh, uh, communities that are heavily policed, 
um, in places like New York, like Boston, <coughs> Philadelphia, DC. Um, and as a result, they end up with, with criminal records. Um, well, those, those processes then lead to putting folks on the radar of um, immigration officials. And, um, and then we see that those, 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 those criminal convictions um, result in, in um, uh, a disproportionate um, rates of, of immigration imprisonment by, uh, on behalf of ICE and then, and then removal from, from the United States. And quite often, because it's, it's crime related, there are very few ways of avoiding that um, prison time or, 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 or deportation. Um, and, and so the avenues for folks to, to escape that, um, that results are really quite few, few and far between. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, uh, other, uh, parts of your book that, you know, uh, was sort of jaw dropping to me was, um, you mentioned a conversation that you had with one of your students about, um, they asked a question as to who owns, you know, these, these prisons, uh, who owns these detention spaces and, you know, who, how does that investment, you know, trickle down? Um, and, and you had a really interesting conversation about how far reaching uh, that money is and goes, you know, even to the point of some of our, the companies that hold our, our retirement accounts, our investors and hold shares in, in this um, business. And, and I know that, you know, you, in, in general, you speak of, of sort of remaining hopeful for the future, uh, but you also admit that you don't you don't have all the answers. So what what is the right mix of of inspiration and organization that will see these prisons being gone in our lifetime? What does yeah. an abolitionist future look like? Yeah, no, I start I start the book um, with with this uh, line from uh, James Baldwin's uh, famous essay, the, "The Fire Next Time," and let me just read that because I think that that will set the the stage for for my response. He says he he writes in, in in "The Fire Next Time." I know that what I am asking is impossible, but in our time, as in every time, the impossible is the least that one can demand. And what that means to, to 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 me in this context is that you know we have to be able to to name a, a a vision of a more hopeful future, even if we can't articulate every single step along the way. Right, um, and so for me, what that means is to imagine a future in which we don't imprison migrants, in which we don't use immigration prisons, and we have, in which we have abolished the system of, of incarcerating uh, 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 human beings because they dare to, to do exactly what has defined the human condition from the very first moment. That is to move. Right? If you're a religious person, if you're if 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 you if you're if you're a Christian, then then then, then migration mobility begins with the very first family. Family. If you're if you're if you're Muslim, it begins with Muhammad's uh, Muhammad's um, uh, decision to to leave um, Mecca. If 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 you're if you're Jewish, it basically defines the existence of your of, of your community of people across centuries and across uh, places on on the face of the earth. Um, and so, for me, there has to be the sense of a of a, of a, of a future in which there are no, no there are no immigration prisons and 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 I, I have some ideas about how you start moving down that way you see you can, you can start by 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 addressing the fact that you know right now most of the folks who are locked up um, in these places don't have access to lawyers don't have access to legal counsel and so they're being asked to 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 make a claim that they don't belong there by themselves except they're doing it across the room from a trained government prosecutor, right? Um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, I'm a law professor, my, my, my wife is, my two brothers are, my sister-in-law is. You know, when I have a legal question, I hire a lawyer, right? <laughs> Why? Because I recognize the importance of that removed, skilled counsel. Um, and my problems are never anything like, do I get to live with my family? They're never anything like, do I get to, am I going to be sent back to a place where I might die? Um, and so, and, and, and so if we have these very basic steps, right, where we can, we can provide people with legal counsel, we can, we can pair that with social workers who are going to help folks navigate what is a inherently highly stressful legal process. Um, by injecting some amount of stability into the process, by um, pairing them with case managers, they're going to make sure folks know where they have to be and when they have to be there. Make sure they have childcare so that they can attend to their court dates um, with the attention that that 
that that deserves um, and their kids are, are well cared for during that during that time these are these are not cheap of course um, options um, but 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 neither is locking up people um, and yet they the, the, these these retain the dignity of, of, of those human beings in the way that the prison um, strips those folks of of, of their of their uh, of their dignity and so um, um, I, I, I would love to see us begin begin moving in this direction and, and by by adopting those those processes here in Denver um, and in communities uh, throughout the country and cities mostly throughout the United States, um, we've seen local efforts to fund some defense programs um, where absent money from the federal government, um, cities like Denver, uh, private uh, uh, private donors, philanthropic uh, groups have put some resources. Um, not enough resources. And one big fear that I have sitting here today is that as we all see, you know, the, the hit that the economy is taking right now, and the, the hit that um, cities and state governments are, are, are already starting to take, and that's probably only going to get worse, what is going to get cut? And are those programs that are so meaningful, so important, for communities of color, are they going to be the first ones on on the chopping block? Um, and of course, my fear is is that they will that they will be. Well, Cesar, thank you so much for your work, uh, for this book, for your ongoing commitment to to our communities. Um, I want to invite Vinianka and Susie back, um, but before I do, um, you know, in chapter seven, uh, I, I want to leave us with sort of a rhetorical question for everyone watching. Um, you get to the etymology of of the word penitentiary, right? And as we think about how uh, these folks are being treated, um, that word comes from a Latin word for repentance. Uh, the logic then becomes that the imprisonment uh, suggests that moral deviants need to repent. Uh, and so my question, I guess, would be for everyone listening and, and for our society in general is, um, from what does a person seeking a better life uh, need to repent from? Uh, Cesar, thank you so much. Uh, Vinianka, uh, you there to, to bring us home? Thank you both so much. That was so interesting. And um, there's just so many layers of what's happening right now that, um, you know, I mean, we have these bigger structural questions. And then, you know, we're also thinking about how do we thrive? It's, it's this always, you know, constant thing that we're doing of, of helping people survive and helping people thrive. And I think that goes to, you know, the quote that you shared with us about picturing this best world, this something else. Um, and we thank you for sharing all of your thoughts here about what, um, you know, about some really important things that, that I think a lot of people need to know a lot more about. And I also thank everyone who's watching for being a part of our uh, writer and reader community. And uh, I wanna let you know that the work that the word is doing is also in that vein of trying to imagine something better for the future. And that's what this Margins Community Programming is about, and that's what the Margins Conference is about. It's a space where we are bringing together writers from marginalized backgrounds to help promote their writing careers, to help bring their writing careers into their strongest path. That is a space that really doesn't exist very much, and that's a travesty. There are so many, writers from the margins who should get to shine. And we obviously have a lot of important voices who aren't getting to shine. So that's what this project is about. If any of you um, are able to help bring that project to life, if you found this programming useful, and if you would like to help us continue to provide opportunities for writers who both have lost opportunities this year and who need more going forward and who need to come together to build that sense of community. We ask you to, um, to check out the Margins Project. You can find that either by the link in um, the event info, or you can also find that um, on Kickstarter if you search Margins. And any support that you can provide, we know that this is the time where some of us are really kind of not in a position to um, provide financial support. But if there's any little bit that you can share with us, we greatly appreciate it. And also if you just share the news around with other folks, that's a great way to help us as well. Um, one last thing for any writers in the room, the word is also 
the very, very end of our um, application process for the editor writer mentorship. So I just wanted to remind everyone that there's just a couple days left if anyone is in a position to be looking for an editor as a mentor for a manuscript they've got ready. Um, two days, so don't have a lot of time, but there's still some time. <laughs> um, thank you again, Cesar and Bobby, and also um, anyone who's looking who would like to read Cesar's entire book, Migrating to Prison, which I very much recommend, you can find the link to that also in the event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the questions. Take care. Thank you.